um, important to have a bigger section of crust to be able to work with. Um, another second reason why I personally, I don't need huge crust, but I do need, you know, substantial crust, like more, definitely more than a millimeter, is that when you are scraping, sometimes uh, if you have a really thin crust, you can scrape off some of the altered volcanic rock into the sample and it contaminates it even more than a ferromanganese crust would. That makes sense. As a Doppler. Bridge and I have another two zero meters, three zero five. Uh, I got a couple questions about uh, like why we pick which rocks. Um, yeah, so sometimes the ROV needs to move, so we can't stop and pick up a rock. Sometimes it's too large. Sometimes it is stuck, so we can't get it up. So there's a couple reasons why we wouldn't pick up a rock that seems like it would fit the research that's being done. Spotted a good coral. Looks like it might be a bamboo coral. Zoom in on the coral, please. Oh. Yep, so this is a bamboo coral. It's unbranched. Okay, come wide, please. Go ahead, Bridge. So that is... Family carrot or carado I said a day. Yeah, we're getting very bulbous up here. I'm coming up. Yeah, yeah. So these would be like pillow flows. They're very rounded, and then you might see some fractured pillows. Oh, thanks to the chat, we've got an article on uh, laser chasing fishes. <laughs> They're usually in uh, shallow reefs, it looks like. Funny. Yeah. yeah, I don't think any of the fishes down here could see the lasers. Rockfish, that's True. who chases the lasers, it's rockfish. Oh, oh. that's cute. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and not always, and not even regularly, but like, very occasionally. Hey, if it happens, it happens. Oh, it's one of those really purple sea cucumbers. Lots of Geo fans in the chat today. Um, yeah, so Coralie, you need the very, very top or outermost uh, layer for the freshest data, correct? Like you don't like the the other parts of the crust would be considered contaminated for um, your studies for that reason. Not like so. Okay, so the reason why we do the outer portion of the crust, uh, the top scrape method, um, is because when we're doing work with ROVs, uh, the ROVs 
And if we're trying to, the goal of this is to see if there's any relationships between the enrichment of the crust so we can look at specific elements and then plot them against our water data that we get from the sensors on the ROV. So we look at oxygen, temperature, salinity, um, and then we try, and temperature, uh, and then uh, try and see if there's a relationship or anything a correlation between the two um but our water sensor data is for the moment we get the rock so it's current water sensor data so we want to choose the surface that's going to be the most quote unquote current which would be the outer portion what's that stick thing oh so we've got a um it looks like a dead piece of uh Zoom coral in here, please. it has a bunch of barnacles on it, and also a hydrozoan called a tubularid. This is a tubularity hydrozoan. It's pretty cool. This is a really big one. Usually they're a little bit smaller, like it's a little buddy up higher. Little buddy. Thank you. Oh, here's another coral. This one looks like Maybe it's our uh, Milligorgia militaris. That's that same coral we've seen on every sea mount so far in this expedition. Seems pretty abundant on all of these sea mounts. That's the one where they're uh, in a row, right? Yep. So it is in the family Chrysogorgidae. And uh, all the branches line up in a row, and all the polyps are on one side of the branch in a row, all evenly spaced. Yeah, what's the thickest crust we found so far? We just got the rock saw going, so. Looks like there's some sea pens off to the left-hand side. Uh, unfortunately, we won't know uh, which crust is the thickest that we got until I get back to uh, Zoom in, please. my university. Science takes time. All right, yeah, so we got a little sea pen with a, a tiny little brittle star hanging out on it. Look at this big boy. Ooh. Oh my. Yeah. That one's pretty chunky. Can you zoom in on the chunky thing? So this is one of those uh, big sea cucumbers, Benthodites. Oh, and it's got a little uh, associate. Looks like a scale worm. Hmm. Scale worms on the go. Look at that. Yeah. Cool. All right.
Let's check out this little coral. Sure thing. Go ahead, it zoom might in, be please. another one of those bamboo corals. Oop, oh, bonk. no, it's a pronoid coral. It's a very sparse one. Looks like it's branching near the top. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Hello, shrimp. Well, that, that's a little opossum shrimp. All right, I got to go. Ooh, here's a question. If a sea pen is uprooted, um, there's a whole escape plan, but if, just in general, if a sea pen is uprooted, can it reroot itself? Yeah, usually they can. Um, can they survive uh, coming up from, like, if we sample a sea pen? This big fan. Oh no, they they wouldn't risk survive for the journey. But they can reroute themselves. Cool. I'm a little fast and bouncy, but let's go for a zoom here, please. Is it a militaris? Yep. It sure is. Look at them marching. Okay, great. They are very beautiful corals. Yeah, look at this big rock. Whoa. Oh. Can we sample this one? <laughs> sure. I don't know. I think that's a better question for you, Trevor. Can we sample this one? With different equipment. Wow, what a cool rock. Ooh, this might be a really fun sea cucumber. It does look like fun. Okay, zoom in on the fun guy, please. That's fun this guy. One, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a Cycropodes, another type of purple sea cucumber. That's bizarre. So I think this Cycropodes semperiana? What's with the antler? It, that's it's like a little tail um and it uses it to swim we think it's like a little sail oh wild it's a yeah. back antler not a front antler some of the ones that um live on the Bizzle plains have an even longer one hmm. and it makes them look they're, they're kind of like shaped like a squirrel tail and we think we use they use them to sort of sail across the sediment to move to different places so, you know, you might be finished eating in one place and want to take your chances somewhere else. Uh, you do your, like, little crunches to get up in the water column, and then you just sort of glide. I was just about to ask if they also do the ab workout. Yeah. Love all these rock formations. Hey! That's a little squishy. This is a little hydro medusa. So it's a jelly in the hydrozoa. Jellies you might be more familiar with are the scyphozoans. Um, those are the big, big ones. These like little ones are hydrozoans. And they're just so cute. It's 
a question in the chat about ROVs getting stuck somewhere. We heard an awesome story about um, Alvin um, that got... Alvin is a... I know, it's Lover. not an ROV. Okay. Right. Yeah, just, just so viewers know. Right, so viewers know. know. Alvin is a manned submarine, so a little scarier to get uh, stuck. Um, and yeah, they did get wedged somewhere, and they had to kind of wiggle their way out. So. Um, but thankfully, we have so many cameras and so much uh, preventive, so many preventative measures that we don't get into those situations. And we're not, we're not in manned vehicles, so. But it no. could be dangerous if we were to get stuck because we are attached we are to attached. this ship. So if the ROV gets stuck, the ship is essentially anchored. Very long anchor. Yeah. So we're just we just do our best to avoid any situation that might arise that might entangle us. So if we were to find fishing gear um, on this seamount, we would avoid it and go to a new location. I've done uh, fishing gear, discarded fishing gear surveys around coastal British Columbia, and it is treacherous. Yeah, that sounds terrifying. Yeah. Do you have any well, kind of zoom like in the sponge? slicing device down there? Slice device. Yeah. Um, you have a little pocket knife? No. Not with that ROV. Just a little inspection glass thing. All right, I'm sorry, I'm bouncy here. Um, so this is a question we get a lot. Uh, why would animals have color when it's dark? But there's uh, several reasons to have color, right? Like sometimes color is a, a chemical thing. So it might be um, that they're releasing some water. sort of chemical into the... Uh, water for whatever reason, right? Like mating or a warning signal. Oh, that, that's bioluminescence. Yeah. But like, oh, that was that's sponge. kind of like color. Yeah. <laughs> but Cause you know, same question. Like if there's, you know, like why are eyes, these sea like cucumbers see. purple versus another color? Purple is in the red spectrum. It looks more black, uh, helps you not be seen, but not a lot of things eat sea cucumbers. Um, other reasons for color might be, um, you know, these volatile compounds um, that deter predation uh, often have color to them. So, and there is no detriment to being colorful in a dark environment. So it so hasn't why been. Why not? Why not be colorful, right? Yeah, why not be <laughs> colorful? So you see things that are pink or, or purple. Um, you often see red coloration. Ooh, that's wow. That's a cool rock. Oh, that's cool. It looks like a fractured pillow. So that you have these like low bait sort of pillowy, drippy forms, and then they fracture in this very specific sort of angular radial way. That has something to do with cooling of basalt. Yeah, so it was kind of weird because at the bottom it looks like, and at the sides of it, it kind of looks like columnar jointing which is something you wouldn't have when you have pillow basalts. Um, but what happens is uh, when you have a liquid and then you dry it, it's like all liquid and then you completely dry it or it cools down or whatever. Um, it fractures in this really specific way and it fractures at 120 degree angles always. And so we see it a lot in volcanic rocks because if you have a magma and then it all dries uniformly, you get columnar joining. So um, there's a couple national parks you can go to to see that. Uh, but it also happens with mud. So if you have mud and then it all dries, uh, mud cracks also have the 120 degree angle um, little segments as well. Very cool. This is awesome looking. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, someone actually did the story problem math from earlier. Oh no. I am not going to check this math, but they based it off of a, a estimate, a surface area estimate uh, from NOAA from 1953. 
and it would take a minimum of 206,563,972 years. Oh, geez. How, how many million years? <laughs> 206, 206 million. million years to ROV survey the entire ocean floor? At this speed, yep. Hmm. With We're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> one, ROV, yeah. one ROV at a time, right. So we are surveying, like, multiple vessels are surveying. So it'll take less time than that. <laughs> now we're down to like 40 million years. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Nailed it. I guess it'd be the question of how many ROVs would we need to, to reduce that time to something more reasonable. So many ROVs. Sure. I guess that's yeah. why uh, the AUVs. AV, yeah, AUVs could probably do it a little faster. Yeah. Um, AUVs are a good tool for surveying an area quickly while you're doing something else. Like eating chips. Yeah, well, like if you were on a, like like a cruise. Chips. Like <laughs> if you were on a cruise like this, you could send the the, R the AUV to go do its thing for, you know, 24 hours while we do a dive somewhere else and then, you know, recover the AUV. Like, I've heard of AUVs getting lost while there's an ROV in the water and the ROV seeing the AUV and be like, oh, <laughs> get out of here. Oh, jeez. Very scary. That is oh scary. Goodness. Yeah, technology is not, uh, doesn't function quite like people think it does. We're quite a ways away from robots taking over the world. Um, oh, yeah, someone is uh, asking about the, the map. I did not check this map, so it was, I said 206 million, well, plus, but um, I don't know. That's not that's not a uh, an answer that we have come up with. That was someone that did the math at home. So who knows? Might be some interesting animals up there. I think I spot a Brasingid sea star, possibly a sponge. Let's go for a zoom on those guys, please. It's a demo sponge. This is a demo sponge. And yep, and the other, our orange friend with the many legs is a Brasingid sea star. They are filter Thank feeders. You. They hold their arms up into the water column to feed. And then that um, sponge is a Stylodorix. It's a type of demo sponge. So it's not a glass sponge like the sponges we've been seeing consistently. Um, on the sea mounts, but a different type of sponge. And I should clarify, not because it's coming in up in the chat, but just because we should clarify. Um, there's a difference between mapping the seafloor and exploring and surveying the seafloor. So it's two different things. We want to have the world's oceans mapped by 2030. That's the goal. Aaron, do you think that's going to happen? Not a chance. Hey, hey. It could. <laughs> Positive vibes. We're going to need more boats. We're, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> yeah, uh, So, but that's the goal. Um, and But to actually have ROV eyes on all of these areas is going to take significantly longer. Have we ever come across signs of ancient civilizations that weren't known? So um, I don't know that 
uh, Nautilus has, but uh, several uh, sunken cities have been found over time. There are some sea pens down the lower part of the screen. So we've only been seeing one species of sea pen so far? Um, yeah, that's I, I've only spotted the one that the white one that has that associate. I'm sure we'll probably end up seeing a couple more as we make our way up the seamount. I can't wait. It's going to start to get interesting. It's already interesting. It's pretty interesting, yeah. yeah. I guess it was interesting about three minutes ago. And now it's still interesting. Oh, there's another one of those big dead sponges. Seems like every seamount had like a lot of those big uh, Faria dead sponges. But we haven't been seeing any live large Faria sponges. I think there was a polychaete over to the right. Little loin. Um, here's the question. We get mapping data from non-scientific vessels, don't we? Like, at, at, at a different um, quality? Um, I'm, I'm confused by the question a little bit. Are we Do we use mapping data, or is this just very, very yeah, general? They were um, asking, like, it, you know, could you put, like, a multi-beam on, on a cargo ship, even though it's not, like, a research vessel or an exploration oh, vessel? for sure, yeah. I mean, yeah. People put multi-beams on yachts, and right. I think there may be a couple sailboats. Like, um, but, yeah, yeah, and I think they, they try and okay, do some crowdsourcing projects, too, where they put very simple um, single mm -hmm. beams on on any vessel of opportunity. Um, so you can get some level of mapping data from anything, really. Yeah. It's just uh, how much you get, the quality of it, and and all of that comes into play. But yeah, and there's, uh, is it Olex? Does, is that the name of the company? There's a company that takes single beam data from like all fishing boats that will run a single beam or a fish finder and compiles that. They have a pretty extensive database of cool. bathymetric values, and they, they sell that information uh, more for um, people who like to go fishing. But it is a ex pretty extensive database of, of just, just single beam that adds up to be quite a lot of data. Kind of related, but not quite the same. Um, Ocean Networks Canada has partnered with uh, BC Ferries, British Columbia, to put a lot of scientific sensors and instrumentation on the ferries yeah. because the ferries do their routes you know yeah, yeah. every two hours one way then back the other way then back the other way all day every day they're taking whatever information that uh they can get which is pretty cool that is pretty cool yeah there's a, a few projects like that and i i love that idea of just getting information from any boat yeah 
and systematic information from people who do the same route every yeah that's very very consistent you get it every every two hours in exactly the same spot you get a lot of large data set from that which is good there's another one of those antler ones okay i'll check this one out first and i'll go over to the right Nice. Uh, this is probably a Hansenothuria or Paleopatites. Um, oh, and then we got another one of the Cycropodes Semperiana. Have we been back to the octopus garden this season? No, I don't think so. I'm looking through the through the season's expeditions, but no, nope, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, we get asked a lot what is the most interesting slash odd thing we've seen on the seafloor. Um, so it changes every cruise. Um, I mean, if it depends on what you consider odd, because like we saw a flip flop, and that was odd to be on the seafloor. Uh, but we also saw, you know, an acorn worm, which was pretty cool, and a spoon worm. And it was meant to be on the seafloor. Yes, <laughs> things that should be on the seafloor that are odd. I mean, I consider that a. Uh, Tusk sea cucumber, pretty odd. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really like the psychropodes. They <laughs> they make me happy, especially the big yellow one. There's yellow ones. Yeah, they have the ones that have the really really long tails are uh, called psychropodes longicata. No, oh, I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, our common name for them is gummy squirrel because they kind of look like the oh, texture of like a gummy. I get it, yeah. And it has a tail that looks kind of like a squirrel. Yeah. I can dig it. Some people are like, I don't see it. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I see it every you know, time. Like what was that? Uh, uh, the turbo engine one? Turbocharger. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't really look like a turbocharger. But, like, I get it. It's got, like, so the tubes. It could look like something mechanical. Though I do like our common name of the uh, hamster tunnel sponge. The hamster tunnel sponge. See, to me it looks like, uh, oh, man, what's the, the big pasta? Oh, uh, yeah, the big round, one, like, short tubes. Yeah, short tubes, but, like, chunky. Yeah, all clicked to, connected together. Pasta has so many different names. I know. I could look it up. But those are good. Uh, do we ever get... Uh, yeah, we get bonus samples when animals try to cling on to the ROV. Usually, like, a just a little thing. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't happen often, but in, in some places, yeah, like a, a fish could swim in and it gets stuck or a little bit of coral could get snagged. Yep. That happens when there's, it's almost impossible to fly through and survey the community because there's so, so much density. One of our cruises last year, there's a, is it a McTophid, the little lantern fish? Is that the right? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. correct. Um, one of they came up, kind of just hanging on the bottom of oh, the no. ROV. But it was cool because uh, my my thesis is about acoustics and the scattering layer, and uh, Andrew Thurber was the lead, and he listened to me tell that story, and then made sure to show me the mctofa because it's one of the biggest components of the scattering layer. Um, it was pretty cool. That is really cool. Oh, you're the person working on their thesis. I was told that someone on board was working on their thesis. I think, like, everyone <laughs> on board is working on a thesis, it feels like.
It's done. I just have to defend. Nice. nice. And it's just masters, just to be clear. It's not just a masters. Yeah, masters it's a is master. A, it's a lot of work to just masters. a masters. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but I also drew it out as long as possible. <laughs> hey, you're busy. Word. You're too busy. <laughs> you're too busy mapping the oceans for. That's right. That's right. I'm too busy working. You single-handedly are that's mapping the oceans by 2030. So that's a lot of work. That's absolutely true. <laughs> Every word of it. <laughs> oh, someone in the chat saw the uh, spoon worm. Yeah, it was awesome. I like the, the mysterious build to it. Yeah, there was a lot of suspense. I think there's like a little star over there. Oh, your eyes are so good. That's what a lot of watching this video will do to you. <laughs> You're like, oh, I, I spot a small disturbance in the force. <laughs> so do you like annotating? I do. I do like it. Um, I like listening to some of the silly conversations oh, that no, happen. Oh, no, that's right. It uh, comes with audio. Yeah, it does come with audio. Zoom in, please. I, I, I like seeing all the new animals and, like, trying to figure out what they are. Oh, so yeah, this, oh, okay, this is different. What, what are you? I, I'm trying to decide if it's, like, the sea star we collected yesterday or if this is something different. Uh, I think it's something different. It's pink, because the other ones we were collecting were white. And the bubble was, like, and pearlescent. It's, yeah, it's, like, bubbly. What type are we at? Can are we, we eyeballing this as a potential sample? Yeah, can okay. we? Bridge yep. nav hold Come position. Wide. Thank you. Uh, I think it might be a cookie star. Oh. But I don't remember Kay. seeing anything that looks like this. Let's go. Is this suckable? Uh, it's too big for that. Too big? Okay. Turn on craft power, please. This sure. one could be the one that we've ID'd as Gonia Sturdy Pink. Which means we don't know what it is. Okay, so how about I try to suck it, and then if it doesn't go, we'll put it in a box. Okay, perfect. Wait, you said that means you don't know what it is? I don't, well, we, it, it, I think it's a cookie star, so a sea star in the family Gonia Sturdy. What's What jar is open? Two through seven. Two through seven. Yeah, I'm lined up on two. Oh, I see. Because you tagged it as pink. You don't know which. Okay. Got yeah, it. I just like gave it a color because I thought, oh, we thought it was like, well, it's different because usually they're white to orange and it's sort of a pink color. Uh, just looking through the pictures. Okay, can you give me some suction, please? And we're still pretty deep. So that sort of. So do you want me to try to shake it up and stuff them in there, or do you want me to put them in the box? Um, let's put them in the box. Okay. Stand by on the box. I'm gonna get real close. Okay. Uh, there's a carnivorous sponge in BioBox B. Just don't put, don't put it in there. Don't put it in B, Roger. You can put it in A though. Bio box. It would eat a. It would eat this. Okay, go ahead. Oh, it won't eat the sponge. Good there. The sponge won't eat it. No. Okay, you can stop suction. Okay. It's way too big for the carnivorous sponge to eat. Oh, okay. Well, we'll put it in A just to be sure. Yeah, it'll be safer there. Suction's off. Okay, close okay. the box. It won't get crushed if the rocks move around. Is that one one three? Mm. Gotta go. That was sorry. Yeah, that was one one three. Okay, thanks. A lot of these uh, cookie stars from deeper depths have not yet been described, so or collected. Come up on We've been finding a lot of new ones, um, and just sort of. 
living them with an open ID of new species or unknown. Um, so collecting these will be really useful. All good? Okay. Bridge nav, two zero meters, zero one six. That's one of those blind ones, isn't it? To the left, the fish. Fish to the left. Left, left. Down, bottom left, no, very like bottom. The oh, I, it was being blocked my my Twitter. Oh, look at him. Uh, oh, that's the uh, Acanthonus armatus, I think. Zoom in, please. See if it has a, like that lumpy head. It's kind of spiky. Yeah, so this one's not blind. Oh. Bonk. Bonk. Mm. Now it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that's the Acanthonus armatus. It has a really funny common name. You can look it up yourself. Oh, that's the one. Looks like this rock right in the center came oh, wow. off the one on the left. It did. That is definitely a broken pillow. What would break a pillow like this? Would that be during the cooling time or would it be later on? Uh, sorry. Um, I'm trying to... Well, it looks like there's crust on it. It's possible that it could on both sides. So it's possible. I think it broke. I don't know. Maybe... It's hard to tell because you can't see the underside. You zoom in on this pink thing, purple thing. What color is that even? Maybe I think it probably cooled and then something broke it and then it crusted over afterwards. Look at the back ripples on that guy. Um, so what would possibly break it after it's already cool? Like what comes? What happens subsea to break something like this? What kind so of on terrestrial volcanoes, you can get mass wasting events. Um, Adam gave a talk to us uh, when we weren't diving about how when you build up a side flank of a volcano too much, um, it can put too much pressure and then you can get landslides and stuff like that. I'm not sure if the same thing can happen in the ocean. You know, maybe a meteor impact or something. I don't know. A meteor impact? <laughs> no, don't start that again. Or just a bigger rock. Or sometimes sea cucumbers like come down with their little hard hats and just start like knocking on it with tools oh, yeah. until they break just to confuse us. Right. Really tiny hammers. Yeah, really, really tiny, tiny hammers. hammers. I think that pink one we saw was hard at work. Yeah. <laughs>
There's a stock crinoid. So that is that yellow flower looking guy. Also called a sea lily, that's a common name for stocked crinoids. Oh, oh, here we got a dead sponge. Yep, dead sponge. With a barnacle on top. That looks like it might be an Arella from Noah There's Coral. A good amount of current. Can you zoom in on this guy, please? Yeah, I think this looks like Norella. Polyps are sort of canted downwards. Uh, they're not closed, but it looks like they would close in a downwards position. Um, I see three body scales on the polyps. All right, thanks. Bridge nav, two zero meters, due north, zero, zero, zero.
<laughs> Thanks, Pacro. That was great. <laughs> A uh, question in the chat. Um, someone said they were annotating. What does that consist of? Annotation. What does that consist of? Putting hats on sea cucumbers. Yes. But um, also. <laughs> but also. Um, so uh, when I get video from a dive like this, um, we bring it into a program called VARS, Video Annotation Reference System, that was developed by uh, the Monterey Bay, Monterey Bay Aquarium um, Institute. So uh, they developed the software to annotate video. And uh, I use that software um, to watch through the video and make notes about the animals and substrates um, that I'm seeing. So each animal observed for the first time will receive an annotation along with what the environment looks like around that animal and what that animal is upon. So if it is on the rock or sediment or upon another animal, that'll get noted. Um, we annotate in our lab all the corals, sponges, and associates of corals and sponges, fishes, and then uh, noteworthy animals. So that includes animals that we see uh, in the dive, but we don't necessarily annotate like every single brittle star. Uh, and that's just um, how we've been going about doing it because we're annotating for the Deep Sea Corals project. Um, these annotations will be going into the Deep Sea uh, Coral database. So we don't necessarily annotate every single thing we see, but we do try to make annotations of all the species observed. So it involves, it's a lot of video watching. Some, some of it's boring where uh, not a lot's happening, um, but it can also be really exciting and kind of fun to try to figure out what things are. Um, when we do stumble upon a new animal or an animal we don't recognize or have in our animal guide, there are a bunch of taxonomists that we have developed relationships with that will send photos and ask them um, what that animal is or if they have a better I identification for us. And most of the time the taxonomists get back to us right away and are excited to see these new animals. Um, they'll also ask us if uh, an animal might have been collected and where they can find that collection in a repository. So we also help them can get find animals that might be new uh, and should be targeted for collection and then uh, get them in contact with those collections uh, so they can further their work. So, you know, it's a little bit of a beneficial relationship, though. To be honest, I think I get the, the better end of the deal of getting the really nice identifications. Uh, and these identifications do go into our deep sea animal guides that we also produce in our labs. So um, that includes the um, Okeanos Explorer Deep Sea Animal Guide, which you can find at oceanexplorer.noaa.gov. Um, that's also the Hurl Deep Sea Animal Guide. Oh, look, a uh, Gaza Daedalus. That uh, is that twirly snail. Acrobatic, right? Acrobatic snail. It uses its foot to push itself along the rocks. It is very interested in getting away from us. I believe the snail like feels the vibration of the ROV coming, and uh, it's like, oh my goodness, a giant predator. It's making kind of counterproductive progress, but... <laughs> yeah. It, I think it's so impressive, this, mm -hmm. this response that it has. It's always really fun to watch. Could, could you imagine if your response to danger was just flailing? Like, I mean, that might is kind of it is not is. my <laughs> response to danger? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we practice emergency drills. Exactly. <laughs> just flailing about. I don't know what to do. Flail. Panic, panic, also, panic. our entire emergency drill is 
just come to this spot and we'll tell you what to do. <laughs> that's, 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 that's not true. Because oh. they tell you to put on your life jackets. It's true, yes. We do have to put on life jackets and bring uh, protective sun gear like hats, uh, jacket. And then they tell us what to do. Oh, question. So, yeah, the emojis. We have a uh, Telestrator, which is amazing. It comes from the sports world. So, you know, if you're like watching a football game and they draw like the little O's and X's on everything and all the sweepy lines, I have no idea why we have access to emojis, <laughs> but. Uh, it makes it fun that we have all kind of functionalities. Oh, um, yeah, we just sort of discovered that that was a thing. So, um, of course, we had to try to make use of it. Absolutely. I thought it was just banjos, but I guess it's all. I all thought emojis. it was. Yeah, I thought it was just banjos too. We have a fat library of emojis. Yeah, it's like <laughs> every emoji that's on your phone is also on this Telestrator. It's very practical. Mm hmm. Maybe I can like build up my the fish identifications, throw them on the screen. That would be awesome. I think right now we have dolphin and lobster. Yeah, <laughs> which we're not going to see either of those things. So yeah, it, if we could show you, which we cannot, uh, the library is expansive. Even of the tools that we have to draw on the screen. Um, we have some that we're not utilizing. What is that? That little flaily squish him. All right, I found my favorite one. It's going to summit the octopuses. Yes, that's a really nice emoji, too. Yeah, it's really cute. Maybe we'll see an octopus now. Really? For the, all that octo luck this Saturday. Octopus Friday on Saturday. Octopus Friday on Saturday. Hey there, Coralie. Now time for a... Oh, see, in my head, all I can think of is another Coralie question, but it's a it's a rock question. It's a geology yeah. question. There we go. <laughs> uh, is it known if the sediment changes in composition at different depths on these seamounts? Because the substrate sometimes looks like rivers running down the rocks, and they're wondering if it's just gravity or if it's a change in the, in the composition of the substrate. Yeah, so... Um when you saw, we saw those like ripples and like now it just kind of looks blah. Um, that's a change in the deposition. So the like ripples are because there's currents that push the, um, push the sediment down that way. Um, in here, probably because there's so many, so much more rock, a uh, hard substrate as opposed to loose sediment. Um, when currents are pushing, it's harder to see those uh, finer details. Uh, and I don't know.